Welcome to Backspace Academy. We're currently at the start of all the pathways to AWS certification preparation with Backspace Academy. So it doesn't matter whether you're just going to go on and do the Cloud Practitioner certification, or if you're going to go further and do an associate level certification like the developer or solutions architect or sysops administrator associate, this is still fundamental required knowledge for you to proceed any further. So make sure that you don't skip over this and do it. And without any further ado, let's get into it. So what is the AWS Cloud? AWS has invested billions of dollars in IT resources that are distributed across the globe. And the use of those resources is shared amongst thousands upon thousands of AWS account holders. Now, although those resources are shared amongst those account holders, the accounts themselves are completely isolated from each other at the hypervisor level. You also have the option of your own dedicated resources if you wish. You as an account holder can have on-demand delivery of IT resources on a pay-as-you-go pricing model with no upfront cost. You only pay for what you use. The more you use, the more you pay. The less you use, the less you pay. When you don't use it, you don't pay for it. When you use it, you pay by the hour or the minute or the second. And some services even provide billing by the millisecond. Now that provides some really good economies of scale because the cost of that infrastructure is shared across thousands upon thousands of account holders. If you're a large enterprise, that is great because you don't have to worry about the capital expenditure of your own infrastructure. And you don't have to worry about the maintenance staff to support that infrastructure. Now that infrastructure is organized according to a range of different product types. If you want to use those IT resources for pure computing power, AWS can do that for you. If you want to use AWS just to store data, AWS can do that for you as well. If you want to run a database as a service, if you want to run a relational database, a NoSQL database, a graph database as a service, AWS can do that for you. And they'll do that on demand on a pay as you go pricing model. The AWS global infrastructure is massive and is divided into geographic regions and those geographic regions are divided into separate availability zones. As you can see, there are lots of regions distributed throughout the globe. For this course, we will be using the North Virginia region because that is the largest region and supports all of the available AWS services. If you're using a smaller region, for example, Mumbai, you may encounter problems if it doesn't support all of the services. The AWS GovCloud is located in the US West Coast and is specifically for US government organizations. There is also a, an AWS secret region, and I can't tell you where that is because it's a secret. That region is specifically for U.S. government intelligence organizations. And in case you're wondering, yes, the CIA is a customer of AWS. Your choice of region can depend upon a number of things, and you may want to have the lowest latency, and you want your server to be located as close to your customers as possible. But you may also want to minimize costs. For example, I'm located in Sydney, but I mainly use the North Virginia region because it is cheaper for me. You may also want to locate your server in another country for regulatory reasons, or you may want to be located in your country for regulatory reasons. So there are a number of factors to take in, to, into consideration when selecting a region. Each region is divided up into at least two availability zones that are physically isolated from each other. This provides business continuity for your infrastructure if you have it distributed across multiple availability zones. If one availability zone goes down, the infrastructure in the other availability zone will continue to operate. The largest region, US East North Virginia, 
has six availability zones. And the availability zones are connected to each other through a high speed fiber optic network. There are over 100 edge locations that are used for the CloudFront content delivery network. CloudFront can cache your popular content, such as images and videos, and distribute that to edge locations across the globe for high speed delivery to your end users, no matter where they are located. And it'll do that with very low latency. It also provides great protection against DDoS attacks. The AWS Management Console is a web-based interface to AWS and we'll use it throughout the course to access AWS services. And you'll also use it to monitor your costs. You need to have an account to access it, but once you have an account created, you can access it simply by clicking on the My Account menu from the AWS website and then selecting the Management Console. There's also an AWS Console mobile app and that is great for tablets. You can also access AWS resources through the many software development kits. This allows you to create applications that use AWS as a back end. There are SDKs for all the major languages and there's also a mobile SDK. It's also possible to access AWS with direct HTTP calls using the AWS REST API. You can also install a command line interface on your desktop and that will allow you to remotely connect into AWS and also be able to create and run scripts to automate a lot of the processes on AWS. The AWS website is located at aws.amazon.com. What I want you to do now is to go to that website and bookmark some pages of the website. The first one is the certification page, and that will have links to everything you need to know about the certification process. So if you're not sure what certification to do, or you want to know how to schedule and sit an exam, that is a place to go. The next one is the documentation page. Throughout the course, we will be referencing the documentation for the services on AWS. So that is a very important link. and the exam, it's going to be testing your knowledge of a lot of this documentation. AWS also has a site specifically for white papers and they discuss technical issues and use cases for AWS. The products page gives a really good overview of the main products of AWS. And finally, the new products and services page and that'll keep you up to date on the latest things that are happening in AWS. Okay, let's get started with AWS. First off, go to aws.amazon.com. Click on the orange sign up button in the top right hand corner and complete that sign up process. You'll need to have a credit card to sign up, but don't be too concerned as there is a free tier available for a 12 month period. And most of the course will be operating under that free tier. We can also set up a billing alert to alert you if you exceed your budget. For example, we can set up a $5 billing alert to notify you if, you if you exceed $5 for the month. Once you've created that account, you can then get into the management console by clicking on the My Account menu and selecting AWS Management Console. Coming up next will be some hands-on labs on AWS services. So make sure that you download the lab notes that come with this introduction to AWS before proceeding any further. And once you've done that, I'll see you in the next lecture. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. Coming up next, what I'm going to do is run through all of the products and services that are offered on AWS. Now, there's an enormous amount of services, so rather than go through them all in one hit, I'm going to break it up into a lot of sections. And then at the end of each section, I'm going to give you an example of how to use those services. And then after that, we'll do a hands-on session or a lab where you can actually use those services yourself hands-on. 
So what I need to do now is just give you a very quick introduction to the different types of cloud computing models that are available. Infrastructure as a service, it contains the basic building blocks for cloud IT. What that means is that that is nuts and bolts stuff. So if we want to launch a Linux server and we want to manage that Linux server ourselves, that is how we would do that as infrastructure as a service. And we would do that using the Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2 service. The next level is Platform as a Service or PaaS. And that's where AWS will take a little bit more control over what, you know, over the underlying infrastructure. So AWS manages that underlying infrastructure and the hardware and operating system normally. And a good example, that would be the relational database service. And in that service, AWS, they provision all the operating system, the server and everything to run that, but you still need to do the high level administration of that database. And then finally, we've got software as a service or SaaS. And that is a complete product that normally runs in a browser and it is mostly refers to end user applications. A good example of that would be Office 365 or Salesforce.com. And you'll hear another term used a lot with AWS and that is serverless computing. And so that allows you to build and run applications without having to think about servers. You know, you don't need to provision the server yourself. AWS will do that for you. It's also referred to as function as a service or abstract services. Examples of that are the simple storage service where we will be using at the end of this lecture, where we create a bucket and we put objects and files into that bucket. We don't know what's behind that bucket. Obviously, there's going to be an operating system, most probably a Linux operating system, a file server. There's going to be hard drives. We don't need to worry about that because AWS, they look all that, after all that for us. AWS Lambda is where you can run code in the cloud Again, without service, you just provide AWS your code. AWS looks after everything for you. DynamoDB is a NoSQL database in the cloud as a service. And Amazon Simple Notification Service that can send out notifications to your users. So that's a pretty quick introduction of the different types of cloud computing models. The best way to really get a good knowledge of it is to go through all these products, get your hands on with them, and then you'll fully understand it a lot better. So there's only one more thing to do, and that is, let's get into it. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we're going to run through some of the storage services that are available on AWS. Then we'll look at some examples of how you can use these. And finally, we'll finish up with a hands-on lab using one of these services. Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3 for short, it's designed to store and access any type of data over the internet. It's a serverless service, and as such, we don't need to worry about what is behind it. There's obviously a file server, an operating system, a hard drive, but we don't need to be concerned about that at all. We just simply need to create this thing called a bucket, and then we upload objects to that bucket. The bucket grows as we add objects to it, and the size of that bucket is theoretically unlimited. AWS, it just looks after everything for us. Amazon Glacier is the cheapest storage option on AWS, and it's used for long-term archiving of data. It's a serverless service, just like Amazon S3, but it is not as readily accessible as S3. So it should only be used for content that is to be archived. You can also set up a lifecycle rule that will automatically migrate old data in Amazon S3 automatically over to Glacier for long-term archiving. Amazon Elastic Block Store, or EBS for short, is a highly available low latency block storage and it's specifically for attaching to servers that are launched with the Amazon EC2 service. We'll learn more about the EC2 service coming up. 
And it's similar to attaching a hard drive to your computer at home. Works in the same manner. It's block device storage. Amazon Elastic File System, or EFS for short, is network attached storage. And it's specifically for Amazon EC2 servers. Because it is network attached storage, this allows multiple servers to access the one data source. In a similar way to a NAS on your network at home can be accessed by multiple computers on that network. The AWS Storage Gateway enables hybrid storage between on-premise environments and the AWS Cloud. It provides a low latency performance by caching frequently used data on premises while storing the less frequently data in Amazon Cloud Storage Services. A Snowball device is a portable petabyte scale data storage device that can be used to migrate data and large amounts of data from on-premise environments over to the AWS Cloud. You simply download your data to the Snowball device, then you send it off to AWS, who will then upload that data to an AWS storage service for you. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples of using the AWS storage services. In orange there, we've got the AWS Cloud. Now, we can create a VPC inside that AWS Cloud. And that VPC or virtual private cloud is our own private space within the AWS Cloud. And that is an impenetrable fortress against attack. And no one will be able to enter our own private space without us allowing that to happen. So let's just say we launch two servers in our VPC. Now we want these servers to have access to data and somewhere to store that data. And so in a normal environment, you would just add a hard drive to that server. So in the same way, we can attach an Amazon Elastic Block storage device to our servers. So that's great. We've now got high speed access to our data. But what if we want that data to be available to both of those servers? So here we've only got, or we've got two EBS volumes. What if we want that data to be on one volume only? So as we know it on our computer at home, we can't attach a hard drive or a block device hard drive to multiple computers. It just doesn't work like that. So in a situation like that, in your home network at home, you would just go out and purchase a NAS, a network attached storage device. You would attach it to your network. You would set up your operating system in your desktop computers to have a mount target for that network attached storage. So when you go to your G drive or whatever it is, or E drive or F drive, whatever it is, that will point to that network attached storage. In the same way that we can do that with our network at home, we can do the same thing with AWS. So Elastic File System is network attached storage. And so that, with a mount target, can enable multiple servers to access the one data source. Now, what if we don't want to worry about mount targets and block devices and all this sort of stuff. We just want somewhere we can upload objects to in a similar way do we do with Google Drive or something like that. And we also want to have an automated solution that over time migrates that data over to something more low cost and more long term for archiving. Now that is where Amazon S3 comes in. And so we can use Amazon S3 to create a bucket, store objects in that bucket, delete objects, do whatever we want with it. And we can also set up a life cycle rule on that bucket so that over a period of time, as objects age, they can be migrated over to an Amazon Glacier Vault for long-term archiving. It will still be accessible. It just won't be as readily accessible as the S3 bucket. But the advantage is that we'll be using 
the lowest cost storage that's available on AWS. Now, that S3 bucket will be located in the AWS cloud. It's not located in our VPC. So remember we said the VPC is our private space within the AWS cloud. And nothing gets through it without us allowing it to come through. So that is where the VPC endpoint comes in. So we can create one of those and that will allow traffic to flow in and out of our VPC specifically for that S3 service. So let's have a look at a hybrid storage example where we've got on-site storage in a corporate data center and we've also got that stored in the AWS cloud in Amazon S3. Why would we do that? Well, it's great for a disaster recovery solution because it provides high-speed access to our data in our corporate data center. And at the same time, we're taking advantage of the durability and availability of Amazon S3 as a disaster recovery solution. So the first problem that we're going to encounter is that this corporate data center will have petabytes of data. And to transfer that over via the internet to the AWS cloud is not going to be practical. So AWS, they can send out to us a snowball device. And that is a high capacity device that can store petabytes of data. And so we can upload, when we receive that, that snowball device from AWS, we can upload our data to that. And then we can send that back to AWS and they will upload that for us into the Amazon S3 bucket. And so that solves that problem for us. So then we've got to find a solution for making sure that the data in our corporate data center is synced with our AWS cloud. Now that's where the AWS storage gateway comes in and that will orchestrate all of that for us. And so if you have got a high speed link between your corporate data center and the AWS cloud, which you can with the AWS Direct Connect service, you can have the AWS Storage Gateway to orchestrate and manage that all for you. And what it will do, it will get your popular content, your content that is frequently accessed, and it will store copies of that on site in your on site storage. But at the same time, it will store all of that data in an Amazon S3 bucket for you. And so then you've got the advantage of having all of the uh, all of the durability and availability of Amazon S3 as a disaster recovery solution. But at the same time, you've got high speed access to your data, which is cached on the corporate data center. Let's have a go at using the Amazon S3 service. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to use the AWS Management Console to connect into the AWS Cloud. And then we're going to create an Amazon S3 bucket. We're going to upload files to that bucket. And then we're going to download files from that bucket. And then finally, we're going to empty and delete that bucket. Now, there are lab notes for this lab and the further ones coming up. So make sure that you download the introduction to AWS lab notes that come with this course. And let's get into it. Now, before we start the lab, you need to make sure that you have signed up for an AWS account. If you haven't, uh, click on the sign up button up here uh, at the AWS website. Once you've completed that sign up process, make sure that you take note of the email address and password that you use to sign up with. So once that's done, you can go to my account and select the AWS management console. Once you've done that, you can log in using that email address that you use to create your account and the password that you use as well. So once you do that, you'll be into the AWS Management Console. Once you've logged into the AWS Management Console, you can now go to the S3 Management Console. So go to Services. Now, normally these are grouped like this according to product category, but I always select A to Z because it's, it's a lot easier to find things. So just go to S3, obviously under S. And what we want to do now is that we want to create a bucket and we're going to create a bucket to put some files in. 
So let's click on Create Bucket. We'll give that bucket a name. So it has to be a unique name, not only in your AWS account, but it has to be unique across the entire uh, AWS cloud. So that can be difficult sometimes. So I'm just going to put in a whole heap of rubbish in here. And I reckon that will be pretty unique. And we don't need to change anything else. We're going to use the US East North Virginia region and we click on Next. So we won't worry about all of this other stuff here. We're going to learn more about that as you get on. And certainly if you go on further to become uh, associate level certified, then you're going to learn a lot more about this stuff and a lot more in depth. So we just click on Next for now because it's just an introduction. Now, this is where we create our, or we set our permissions. So what we need to do is just leave this as private. But if we wanted to, we could make it public and public read access. And that would be important if we were going to be creating a website, for example. We could do that here. But for now, we're just going to leave that as private. And we just review that and click on Create Bucket. So that's how easy it is to create a bucket using the Amazon S3 service. So what we can do now is that we can select that bucket just by clicking on the link to it here. And we can upload files to that bucket. So we click on Upload. Now the best and most reliable way I've found of uploading objects is to drag and drop them straight onto this form here. So I've just got a couple of uh, files here, just some um, some Word documents. So you, you just select something that's pretty small and upload that. So there we go. And make sure it's something small that you're uploading. Don't upload something big or you'll be there waiting till Christmas for it to, to upload. So just click on Next. And we can see here we've got the same sorts of questions about permissions. So we're going to leave it as do not grant public read access, just the same as we did on the bucket. We want to keep everything private here. So we'll click on Next. And we've got a, a, a selection for storage classes. So we're going to leave that as it is. But again, further on in the course, we're going to learn more about the different types of storage classes and the benefits of those. But we'll leave that as it is. And we'll click on Upload. So quite quickly, they're pretty small files. They'll upload to Amazon S3. And there we go. So they've been uploaded. And that's how easy it is to create a bucket and upload some stuff. It's really quite simple. Now, if we want to get that, get that back again, for example, all we need to do is to select it and then click on Download here, or we can click on More and Download As. But I'm just going to click on Download here because it's popped up there for me. And there we go. That file has downloaded back for me again. So that's pretty simple. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to delete it all. So delete everything out of that back watch. I just delete one of them. So again, what we can do is click on delete. And we'll click on delete again. And there we go. So that object has deleted quite easily. So another thing we can do now is that if we go up the top here and click on Amazon S3, that'll take us back to our list of buckets. So if we click on that now, and what we can do is if we, instead of clicking on the link here, if we click outside of that link, it will select that bucket for us. And what we can do is that we can empty that bucket. Now, because we're emptying the entire contents of a bucket, it's asking us for the name of that bucket. So I'm just going to copy it from up here and paste it into there and confirm. And there we go. So it's it's emptied that bucket. So if we go back into that bucket, you can see the bucket is empty. So I'm just going to go back again up to Amazon S3. And again, click outside of the link here to select the bucket. And what we can do now is we can delete the bucket. So I'm going to delete that bucket and bring us straight back to where we started. So again, I just paste in the name of that bucket and click Confirm. So there we go. We do not have any buckets. So at the end of each lab, I always try to make sure that I delete everything that I've created. And the reason for that is that you don't want to pay for this stuff. And even if you would have left that here, it still would have been covered under the free tier. But it is good practice to make sure that you delete everything after you've, you've created it if you don't need it later on. So now it's 
up to you to go and download the lab notes. Do this all yourself. I know it's a very, very simple lab, but the course is designed for people that have never used AWS before. And so we will be building upon this. And by the time you get through to the end of the course, you'll be doing some very advanced stuff. So I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we'll have a look at the different options that are available for running databases on AWS. We'll then have a look at a database example. And finally, we'll finish up with a hands-on lab where we'll be creating a database server on AWS and then remotely connecting in to that database. The Relational Database Service, or RDS for short, is a fully managed database service that makes it easy to launch database servers in the AWS cloud and scale them when required. The RDS service can launch servers for MySQL, including variations of the MySQL database engine with MariaDB and Amazon's own enterprise version of MySQL, Amazon Aurora. Standard PostgreSQL is also available and also available as Amazon's Enterprise Aurora PostgreSQL. Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle are also available. Amazon DynamoDB is AWS's NoSQL database as a service. It's a serverless service like Amazon S3 and as such, you don't need to worry about the underlying infrastructure behind it. AWS takes care of everything for you and it provides high speed, extremely low latency performance. Amazon Redshift is a fast, fully managed, petabyte scale data warehouse that is based upon the PostgreSQL database engine. If you're looking for a big data storage solution, Redshift is perfect for this. Amazon Elasticache is an in-memory data store or cache in the cloud. It allows you to retrieve information from fast, fully managed in-memory caches instead of relying for slower disk-based databases. The AWS Database Migration Service orchestrates the migration of databases over to AWS easily and securely. It can also migrate data from one database engine type to another totally different database engine type. For example, you can use it to migrate from Oracle over to Amazon Aurora. Amazon Neptune is a fast, reliable, fully managed graph database service. It has a purpose-built, high-performance graph database engine optimized for storing billions of relationships and querying the graph with millisecond latency. So let's have a look at how we could use these database services. Let's say we have an on-site Oracle relational database and we want to migrate that over to Amazon Aurora on the AWS cloud. The first thing we could do is to launch an RDS instance in our virtual private cloud. And remember, a VPC, it's our own private space within the AWS cloud and no one can enter it without us allowing them to enter. We could use a database migration service to migrate that data in that on-site Oracle database over to a target RDS Amazon Aurora server. Now let's say our new database is becoming overwhelmed with requests for frequently accessed data. And we would like a high speed way of accessing that frequently accessed data. And this is where Elasticache can help us. We can put an Elasticache node in front of that RDS instance, and that will cache our frequently accessed data. And because it's delivering that data from memory, and it's not delivering it from a hard drive, it will be delivered with very low latency. And at the same time, 
the load on our database will be massively reduced. And any requests for anything that is not in the Elastic Cache will be simply forwarded to the RDS instance. And that way we have high speed access to our frequently accessed data, while at the same time, we can still access our less frequently accessed data directly from our RDS instance. Coming up next, we'll be doing a hands-on lab, so make sure that you download the introduction to AWS lab notes that come with this course. We'll be launching a MySQL database instance, and then we'll be connecting remotely into that database instance. Okay, so I'm in the AWS management console now. We go to services, to the database services and RDS. Now that will take us into the RDS dashboard, but if we don't have any RDS instances created previously, then it will go into a welcome screen like this. So we're just going to go to the left-hand side here, click on instances, and we're going to launch a DB instance. Now we have a number of options available for our database engine. We have Amazon Aurora, which as we said previously, is AWS's MySQL enterprise class database. And that is not eligible on the free tier, so we're not going to use that for now. And we have the MySQL Community Edition. And again, there we've they've got the Amazon Aurora. In case you missed it previously, they've put it up there, but we're not going to use it because it costs us money. MariaDB, again, is a MySQL compatible database. And again, if you missed it, there we have Amazon Aurora as well, which we won't be selecting. PostgreSQL, Oracle, and Microsoft SQL Server. So to make sure that we don't get a bill at the end of the month, we're going to click on this checkbox here saying free tier eligible only. And there we can see Amazon Aurora is not eligible for the free tier. So we go into MySQL and we can see Amazon Aurora there is grayed out again. We can't select it. And we're going to select the MySQL Community Edition. And again, we make sure that we have this option here available. It says only show options that are eligible for the RDS free tier. We don't want to get a big bill at the end of the month. Now, if we scroll down, we have a number of options here. So the only one that we really need to be concerned with is the instance class. So we're going to use a dbt2 micro, which is a pretty small instance, and it's on the free tier. We don't have any other options for storage type other than SSD, where we're working on the free tier. So we leave everything there as it is. Now we go into the settings of our database server. So our database server needs to have a DB instance identifier. It needs to have a name. So I'm just going to call this one backspace intro dash AWS. Now that needs to be unique within your AWS account for DB instances. Next, we're going to create a user and I'm just going to call the master user admin and I'll give that master user a password. Then that password has to be at least eight characters long. So once we've completed that, we've put in our name of our database, we've put in our username for the master user of this database or this database server. And we've put in our master password and we've confirmed that password. We click on next step. Now, we don't need to configure any of these advanced settings for network and security. We just leave the default settings as they are. But as we get more into RDS and other services later on in the course, we'll be getting more involved in this sort of stuff. But for now, we just want to just get our uh, dip our toes in the water or so uh, with AWS. Now we have an option to create a database on launch with this database server. So we're just going to create a database called test. If we leave it blank, then there will be no databases on this database server and we can create those later on. But, but we'll just have one ready to go and we'll call it test. Now we don't need to worry about backups because this is just a lab. We're going to be doing it on the, uh, on the free tier. We just don't want to have any hassle with that. So I'm just going to change the backup retention period to zero. And that will mean that 
it will disable automated backups for the instance. We don't need to worry about monitoring or maintenance. We just leave that as it is. Again, this is just a, a hands-on introduction to RDS. And then we can launch that DB instance. After a certain amount of time, that will be acknowledged and we can view our DB instances. And we can see there that it has a status of creating. And after a while, it will go to being available for use. OK, so after a few minutes, or quite a few minutes, we've got our MySQL database server on RDS up and running, and its status is available. So the thing that we need to understand here is that we can now connect through to this RDS instance through an endpoint. And that endpoint is here, so we need to take note of that. And the, the part that we're interested in is the endpoint domain, so everything there finishing with amazonaws.com and we don't do the colon double three oh six we just select that so i'm just going to select that now because we're going to be using that later on now before we do that we need something we need some software to connect into our mysql instance so we need to go to the mysql homepage and then and there is a link in the lab notes to this to download the mysql workbench and install it to our system. Okay, so here I am in the MySQL workbench and down the bottom there we can see that we have the MySQL connections and we don't have any as yet, so we just click on the plus sign next to it and we'll add our connection to our RDS instance. So we just give that a, a name. So I'm just going to call it Backspace, that will be fine. Now a host name is going to be that connection string that we got or that domain that we got from our RDS console and it's not going to have the colon double three oh six on the end of it it's just going to have the domain details the host name details and the double three oh six uh, is our port number which is already detailed there on the screen now our username is going to be that master user that we set up when we created our RDS instance and, and I used admin and that is all we need. We just need a user, we need a host name, and we need the port that we're connecting on. So if we just test that connection now, it will ask for a password. And we've successfully made that MySQL connection. So we just click on OK and we can add that to there. So once we've created that connection, we can obviously connect into our database. So all we need to do is double click on that. And there we have, we've connected into our RDS database and we've got our MySQL or our SQL dashboard there set up. Now, if we look down here under schemas, we can see that we have that test database that we created or that we requested to be created in our launch configure or when we're doing our uh, configuration for our launch details of this RDS instance. So if we click on that on that information icon next to test, that will give us some information on that. Okay, and there we can see we've got our backspace database with a test schema in there. So our, our server backspace and our test database inside there. So there, there we have it. We've successfully created an RDS instance and we've connected into it using MySQL Workbench, which was pretty great. Now that you've successfully connected in using the MySQL Workbench, I'm going to show you how to connect in with the MySQL shell software and that will allow you to do command line work uh, such as issuing uh, SQL commands to your RDS instance. So the first thing we need to do is to install or download the MySQL shell and there is a link in the lab notes to that URL to do that. Now when you get there just scroll down, uh, select your operating system. If you're on Windows don't do this uh, this installer for Windows. It will install MySQL and all this stuff you don't really need. Uh, all we need is this 16 and a half meg file down the bottom here. So just download that. If you're on a Mac, uh, it will look something like 
this. So you will have a DMG archive that you, you can download and extract after you've downloaded. Okay, so now that we're in the MySQL shell, we can connect into our RDS instance. So the way that we do that is we do backslash, not forward slash, backslash, connect. And then we do our username, which was admin. And then we do at, and then we do that uh, that endpoint, our RDS endpoint. So we just jump back into the RDS console. We'll select that endpoint and copy it and bring it over. Now we don't have to worry about removing the colon double three oh six. We can leave it there or we can take it off and it will default to double three oh six anyway. We enter our password that we created and that should connect us in, in a short amount of time. And there we go. Now what I'd like to do is just issue some SQL commands to the database. So I need to change to SQL mode. So again, we do backslash SQL. And I can issue a command now. So show databases. Now make sure that you put a semicolon on the end of your SQL commands. Otherwise, they're just going to hang there. And then we can see we've got our our standard MySQL databases there. And down the bottom, we've got our test database that was created for us by the RDS service. Now, the test database will be empty. So I'm just going to select one of the system databases there. So the MySQL one will be fine. So I just do use. And then that schema or that database that I'm going to use. So MySQL will be the one that I use. And there we go, schema is set to MySQL. Now, when you do that command, make sure that you don't put the semicolon on the end of it, otherwise it'll hang again. Now, I just want to issue another SQL command again, so we can show schemas this time. Well, actually, no, we'll show tables, actually. And that will list the tables for the MySQL database. And there you go. So there's all those standard tables that you would have in there. So we've managed to connect in using the command line interface or the shell, MySQL shell. And we've switched over to the SQL mode and we've run SQL commands. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump back into the AWS RDS console and we're going to delete all this to make sure that we don't get a bill at the end of the month. And back in the RDS console, we go to, or we first of all, we select our MySQL instance. We go to Instance Actions, and then we go to Delete. We don't want to create a final snapshot. And then we click the acknowledgement that we won't be able to get this back after we've deleted, and we click on Delete. And that will be deleting and eventually it will disappear from the screen if we keep refreshing the screen here. So there we have it. Uh, we've created that instance and we've connected in and now we're cleaning it all up afterwards. So I look forward to seeing you in the next lab. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we'll have a look at the compute and networking services of AWS. We'll then have a look at some examples, and finally, we'll finish up with a hands-on lab where we're going to deploy a WordPress web server using the Amazon EC2 service. Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2 for short, provides virtual servers in the AWS cloud. You can launch one or thousands of instances simultaneously and only pay for what you use. There's a broad range of instance types with varying compute and memory capabilities, and those will be optimized for different use cases. Amazon EC2 auto-scaling allows you to dynamically scale your Amazon EC2 capacity up or down automatically according to conditions that you define. It can scale up or down by launching or terminating instances based on demand. It can also perform health checks on those instances and replace them when they become unhealthy. 
Amazon LightSail. It's the easiest way to launch virtual servers running applications in the AWS cloud. AWS will provision everything you need, including DNS management and storage, to get you up and running as quickly as possible. Amazon Elastic Container Service, or ECS for short, is a highly scalable, high-performance container management service for Docker containers. The containers, they will run on a managed cluster of EC2 instances. AWS Lambda is a serverless service and lets you run code in the AWS cloud without having to worry about provisioning or managing that service. You just upload your code and AWS takes care of everything for you. So let's have a look at how we could use these services to deploy a web server in the AWS cloud. Here we have the AWS cloud and our virtual private cloud or VPC located inside that. And remember, a VPC is our own private space within the AWS cloud. And no one can enter that unless we allow them to enter it. We can launch an EC2 instance and that can be running our web application, for example, WordPress. So what happens if this single EC2 instance becomes overwhelmed by demand? For example, we might have released a new product and our WordPress application cannot deliver the web pages quickly enough to satisfy that. What we could do is that we could tear down that instance and put in a bigger instance that could handle that demand. And that is called vertical scaling. And that used to be all the rage 10, 20 years ago. But the problem is that it takes time to do that. And while we're doing that, our application is not running. And also what happens when the demand goes back down again? Do we have to tear that down and then put in a smaller instance? And what happens if that happens every day? What happens if that happens every hour? It's just not going to be economical for us to do that. What we can do is that we can horizontally scale and we do that by adding more instances. And as demand goes up, we add more instances. And as demand goes down, we terminate those instances. And that way, we still have continuity of our application. Our application will always be running because there's always going to be at least one EC2 instance to look after the demand. One problem with this architecture is that it has multiple endpoints for our web server. And that's not practical because customers are not going to go to one endpoint until that stops working and then go to another one and then another one. It's just not going to work like that. And obviously their bookmarks in their browser are not going to be valid. So we need a way of having one single endpoint for that web application that our customer can go to and then having a way of distributing those requests to a EC2 instance that is available. That is where elastic load balancing comes in. So it can receive traffic from our end users and it will distribute that traffic to an EC2 instance that is available. So a request will come in, it will distribute it to an available EC2 instance. Another request will come in and it will distribute it to a different EC2 instance that is available. And it will balance the load across those EC2 instances. And if one of those EC2 instances become unhealthy, it will fail a health check with the elastic load balancer. And then the elastic load balancer will no longer send traffic to that unhealthy EC2 instance. But what happens if that demand is only for a short period of time, for example, half an hour? What do we do then? It's not going to be practical for us to terminate instances when demand goes down and then launch instances manually when that occurs. We can't do that every hour. It's not going to be practical. And that's where the auto scaling service comes in. It can launch EC2 instances automatically when the demand on those instances increases. And it can terminate automatically EC2 instances when the demand on those instances goes down. 
it can also perform health checks on those instances. And if one of those instances becomes unhealthy for whatever reason, it can replace that instance with a healthy instance. And it will do that automatically without you having to do anything at all. So now we'll have a look at the networking and content delivery services. Amazon CloudFront is a global content delivery network, or CDN for short, that securely delivers your frequently requested content to over 100 edge locations across the globe. And by doing this, it achieves low latency and high transfer speeds for your end users. It also provides protection against DDoS attacks. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, or VPC for short, lets you provision a logically isolated section of the AWS cloud. And you can launch AWS resources in that virtual network that you yourself define. And this is your own personal private space within the AWS cloud, and no one can enter it unless you allow them to enter it. AWS Direct Connect is a high-speed dedicated network connection to AWS. Enterprises can use it to establish a private connection to the AWS cloud in situations where a standard internet connection won't be adequate. AWS Elastic Load Balancing, or ELB for short, automatically distributes incoming traffic for your application across multiple EC2 instances and also in multiple availability zones. So if one availability zone goes down, the traffic will still go to the other availability zone and your application will continue to deliver responses to requests. It also allows you to achieve high availability and fault tolerance by distributing traffic evenly amongst those instances. And it can also bypass unhealthy instances. Amazon Route 53 is a highly available and scalable domain name system, or DNS for short. And it can handle direct traffic for your domain name and direct that traffic to your back-end web server. Amazon API Gateway is a fully managed service that makes it easy for developers to create and deploy secure Application Programming Interfaces, or APIs, at any scale. It handles all of the tasks involved in accepting and processing up to hundreds of thousands of concurrent API calls. It's a serverless service, and as such, you don't need to worry about the underlying infrastructure. AWS looks after everything for you. So let's have a look at an example of how we can use these networking services of AWS. So here we've got the architecture that we looked at before in the compute section. But one thing we didn't mention was availability zones. So let's just say that we've launched that architecture in a single availability zone. What happens if that availability zone goes down? What happens to our traffic? Our traffic has nowhere to go, and our application stops delivering responses to requests. That is why it's always desirable to have our architecture distributed across multiple availability zones. That way, if one availability zone goes down, the other one will continue to operate, and the infrastructure within that other availability zone will continue to respond to requests. We can launch EC2 instances in multiple availability zones, and our Elastic Load Balancing service can distribute that traffic across multiple availability zones as well. So if one availability zone goes down, the Elastic Load Balancer will continue to distribute traffic to the availability zone that is still healthy and to those instances in that availability zone that are still healthy as well. So let's just say our application running on these EC2 instances is a WordPress web server. And that contains lots of images and lots of video that is static content. It's not really changing that much. And it's not efficient for us to continue to keep delivering that from our EC2 instances. 
we would like somewhere to put that where it can be delivered with high speed and low latency and to take the load off our EC2 instances. That is where the CloudFront Content Delivery Network, or CDN, comes in. So we can get these large images and large videos that are not really changing that often, and we can put that in a CloudFront distribution. And CloudFront will cache that and distribute that across hundreds of edge locations across the globe. So when your end user requests that video or those images, it will be delivered to them with really high speed and low latency. And at the same time, it's going to take the load off your EC2 instances and is going to significantly reduce your costs. At the same time, dynamic content that is changing regularly, CloudFront can forward those requests over to the Elastic Load Balancer, which will then forward them to an EC2 instance. So that way, you have the best of both worlds. You have dynamic content delivered as a dynamic content. And at the same time, you have these large videos and images that aren't really changing that often delivered very rapidly. Now that CloudFront service or that CloudFront distribution will have its own DNS name that we can put into a browser and we can directly access that. The problem with that is that that DNS name for that CloudFront distribution will be something very complicated and just won't mean anything to our end user at all. So we would prefer to have our end user type in a domain name and have the request for that domain name forwarded to that CloudFront service. As you can see here, we've got example.com, and that is where Route 53 domain name service can come in. So Route 53 will grab those requests for your domain, example.com, and it will forward those requests over to the CloudFront service, and the CloudFront service will handle it from then on. So let's just say we work for a large enterprise that has its own corporate data center. And the reason it's got its own corporate data center is because that is located where the employees work. And we don't want our employees to be slowed down by a network. We want them to be able to work efficiently. But at the same time, we have resources on the AWS cloud that those employees also need to access. So we need some way of having a high speed connection between our corporate data center and the AWS cloud. And that is where the AWS Direct Connect service comes in. And that can provide a very high speed fiber optic network between our corporate data center and the AWS cloud. And that is completely private. Okay, so that's a very complicated architecture. And don't be too concerned if that's very overwhelming. Because if you're going on to become a cloud practitioner, you're not going to need to really be able to produce this yourself. As an associate level uh, certification, that is a different story. You'd be expected to create this yourself. But Cloud Practitioner, you'll need to know what these services do. You'll need to know that Route 53 will forward requests for your domain name to a backend endpoint. CloudFront will distribute your content to hundreds of edge locations across the globe. Elastic Load Balancer will receive requests and distribute those requests to multiple instances across multiple availability zones. A virtual private cloud is your private space within the AWS cloud. The AWS Direct Connect is a high speed fiber optic network connection between an on-premises corporate data center and the AWS cloud. If you understand that, then you're well on your way to passing the cloud practitioner exam. Okay, so coming up next, we're going to have a lab. So make sure that you download the introduction to AWS lab notes that come with this course. So what we're going to do is that we're going to launch an EC2 instance, and we're going to select an Amazon machine image of a WordPress web server. And that will allow us to deploy a WordPress server on the AWS cloud. 
And then we're going to be able to go to our browser and view our website that was created by that EC2 instance. And we're going to do that all through the AWS Management Console on our desktop computer. Okay, so in the AWS Management Console, we go to Services, we go into Compute Services, and we select EC2. Now that will take us into the EC2 dashboard. If you've never used EC2 before, you might be presented with a welcome screen. But just go to Instances on the menu here and click on Instances. And we're going to launch an instance. Now we first need to select an Amazon Machine Image or an AMI. And that is a template that contains the software configuration, the operating system, application server, and applications that are required to launch an EC2 instance. We can select an AMI provided by AWS from the AWS user community or from the AWS marketplace. Or we could also select our own AMI if we've created an AMI uh, previously, which we obviously haven't. So we're going to go into the AWS marketplace and we're gonna search for a WordPress AMI. So they're the uh, WordPress powered by Bitnami. That will be fine for us to use. So we'll select that one. And we're going to select the T2 micro instance because it is free tier eligible, which means that if we create this instance and then we shut it down afterwards, we're not going to get billed because it's on the free tier. We have a whole heap of other options that we can do but we're just going to go into the configured instance details. And the only thing that we need to change here is to auto assign a public IP. So we need to have a public IP for a public IP address for this EC2 instance so that it can have a presence on the internet and so that we can access it through a web browser. Now, there are a whole heap of other options that we can look at but this is really just an introduction to AWS. We're going to do something very simple and the most simple thing that we can do right now. We're not going to get into discussing any of this stuff because we're going to go into quite in-depth detail on the EC2 service and VPC and a whole heap of other stuff further through the course. So for now, we're just going to click on review and launch and accept everything that we've got there. And we just click on launch. And instead of choosing a key pair, we're going to proceed without a key pair. And a key pair is used to connect directly into our EC2 server. And we're not going to be doing that. So we're not going to be connecting into the Linux operating system. But normally you would. And normally you would download a key pair and you would use that to connect into uh, your Linux server. But for now, we're not going to do that. And we just acknowledge that we will not be able to connect to this instance. Uh, because we don't have a key pair. And we launch the instance. So after a certain amount of time, it will be it will go through its process and will be returned to the EC2 dashboard. And there we go. So uh, we just click on View Instances. And our instance will come up with a status of pending. Okay, so after a few minutes, our EC2 instance status has, or its instance state has changed to running. And that means that we should be able to see our, our web server on the internet. So if, we, if we've selected this instance and we look at the details for this instance, so we go down here and we can see that it has been assigned a public IP address. So in our, in our, when we're configuring our launch for this, we did select to uh, create a public IP, and that is a public IP address that has been created. So if we go to that, we should be able to see our WordPress application. Okay, and there is our WordPress application, and looks great. So we can't really do much with it now because we need to be able to administer our our. WordPress application, you need to be able to log into this site and put web pages on it and whatever. So the people at Bitnami, what they've done is that when this EC2 instance launched, 
they created a username and password and they embedded that in the logs of our EC2 server. So when it was launching, there will be a number of logs that will output information. So we just need to go into those logs. So we'll go back into the EC2 management console. Again, we've selected our EC2 instance. We'll go to actions. We'll go to instance settings, and we're going to get the system log. Okay, so there's the system log. If it first doesn't come up, you just need to give it a bit of time. Just go away, have a cup of coffee, come back, and the, the system log will be there. It doesn't automatically just come up straight away. It just sometimes it does take a bit of a while to come up. So we just scroll down until we find the section where it has our details. So here we can see uh, we're setting the Bitnami application password to that. So we just need to copy that password. So we just copy. And we'll just close out of this. Now, if we go back into, into our user's blog or into our blog there, and we just go to that IP address again, and we go to admin. And that'll take us to the admin section, and we'll need to put in a username. So the user will be user, and then we just need to paste in that password and log in. Okay, so there you can see, well, we won't remember that password. So there you can see that we've logged into our administration page of our WordPress application. So we can do whatever we want. We can, you know, we can add some pages in here. We can go into pages, uh, add, add new page if we want. Uh, we can do whatever we want as we would uh, with any WordPress application. So that's how we launch an EC2 instance or an EC2 server to create a web server. Now, now that we've achieved that and we've created these resources, we're not going to need them anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of them. We're going to delete them all and terminate these instances. So what we'll do is go back into the EC2 management console. We'll go into actions and then we're going to go to instant state and we're going to terminate that instance. And it's just giving us a warning saying that, you know, do you really want to do this? Yes, we do. So yes, terminate. Okay, so after a certain amount of time, and it will take quite a bit of time, that will go from shutting down to terminated. So that's all that we need to do now. So again, there's a lot more to the EC2 service that you need to know. But for now, I think you've got a good idea of how it all works. So it's now your turn to go to go and grab the lab notes and do it all yourself. And I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we'll have a look at the different management services on AWS. We'll then finish up with a hands-on lab where we'll use the CloudWatch service to implement a billing alert on our account. CloudFormation allows you to use a text file to define your infrastructure and to use this text file to deploy resources on the AWS cloud. This allows for the defining of your infrastructure as code and you can manage your infrastructure with the same version control tools that you use to manage your code. The AWS Service Catalog allows enterprises to catalog resources that can be deployed on the AWS cloud. This allows an enterprise to achieve common governance and compliance for its IT resources by clearly defining what is allowed to be deployed on the AWS cloud. AWS CloudWatch is a monitoring service for AWS cloud resources and applications that are deployed on the AWS cloud. It can be used for triggering scaling operations, or it can also be used for providing insight into your deployed resources. AWS Systems Manager provides a unified user interface that allows you to view operational data from multiple AWS services and to automate tasks across your AWS resources. That helps to shorten the time to detect and resolve operational problems. AWS CloudTrail monitors and logs AWS account activity. 
including actions taken through the AWS Management Console, the AWS Software Development Kits, the Command Line Tools, and other AWS services. So this greatly simplifies security analysis of the activity of users of your account. AWS Config enables you to assess, audit, and evaluate the configurations of your AWS resources. This simplifies compliance auditing, security analysis, change management and control, and also operational troubleshooting. AWS OpsWorks provides managed instances of Chef and Puppet. Chef and Puppet can be used to configure and automate the deployment of AWS resources. AWS Trusted Advisor is an online expert system that can analyze your AWS account and the resources inside it, and then advise you on how to achieve high security and best performance from those resources. Okay, let's have a go at using one of these management services. We're going to use a billing and cost management console and the CloudWatch service to create a billing alert and that will notify us when our account has exceeded a budgeted amount. And it will do that using the simple notification service. And we'll learn more about the SNS in the next lecture. Okay, from the AWS Management Console, the first thing we need to do is that we need to enable billing alerts. So we go to our account menu and we go to the billing dashboard and when we when we're in the billing, billing dashboard just go on to the left hand side here to preferences and we just need to make sure that we have checked receive billing alerts uh, and save those preferences and then go back to the console now what we need to do is that we need to go into CloudWatch and we need to create a CloudWatch alarm that is going to trigger whenever these costs are exceeded for the month or the estimated costs are, are going to be exceeded. So we're going to services and then we look into the management tools and we'll find CloudWatch. And then we just jump into alarms and we need to create an alarm. Now we've got a number of metrics here that we can use the ones that we're concerned with are the billing metrics, but we have a whole heap of others there and we'll talk a lot about those going on into the course further on. But for now, we're just going to create a billing alert. So we're going to use the total estimated charge as a, or as a metric. So when we set a limit on that, if it goes over it, it will trigger, trigger an alarm for us. So we'll just click on that. Now what we need to do is we'll just go down to here is we need to select that metric and then we click on next we give the metric a name and what we need to do now is that we need to put in a set point there so what is the point where we want to be receiving an email that there is a problem so if it's you know a thousand dollars is it a hundred dollars or maybe we start off with ten dollars so we'll just make it there $10. So when our costs are looking to, our estimated costs are looking to exceed $10, we'll receive a email from, from the SNS service, actually. And just scroll down to Actions. So what we need to do is define what actions are taken when this alarm changes state. So what we want to do is that when there is an alarm go off, we want to send a notification to, and we're going to send it by email so we're going to click on a new list and we'll give it a we'll give our notification topic a name and then we'll put in our email address now once we've done that we can create an alarm now what's going to happen now is that we will have a notification that we have subscribed to a sns topic and that we need to confirm that that we are going to subscribe to that SNS topic with our email address. And so what's basically happening here is that we've created a CloudWatch alarm. And at the same time, by doing that, we've also created an SNS topic. And this CloudWatch alarm 
is going to notify this SNS topic and when it does that the SNS topic will send out an email or the SNS service will send out an email to us to alert us that there is a problem with this CloudWatch metric that has been exceeded. Now when you receive that email and you click on the link inside that email you will get this this page saying that the subscription has been confirmed so that's looking pretty good so I'll just close out of that. Now back in the management console I'll just close out of that or I can actually now view the alarm and it's saying pending confirmation but if I click on that and if I refresh the screen it's now all ready to go. So now we've actually created that monthly billing alert and it's there up and running and we can see there when the estimated charges exceed uh, 10 hours for six hours we're going to have an email sent out to us. How do we know there's an email? Because we can go into our simple notification service and check. So let's do that. So we go into services and we go into simple notification service. So I just listed them there alphabetically. Uh, but it will be in the messaging area here, so simple notification service. And now we can just have a look at the topics now. And we can see here we've got a topic that's been done there. So let's have a look at that. And there we can see there is our monthly billing alert topic. Okay, so we'll just finish up there. So you've done quite a bit. We've gone through quite a number of very short and quick labs so you'll be getting more and more used to the AWS management console and some of these services and how they all interact together. Now we're not going to tear this one down and clean it up because we'd like to keep it there because I think it's a good idea to have billing alerts so we'll just leave it up and running and every time that you are looking to exceed your monthly cost of ten dollars it'll send you an email and you can change that and decrease it or increase it or whatever you want to do. So I'll see you in the next section. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we'll have a look at the application integration and customer engagement services. We'll then have a look at some examples and finally, we'll finish up with a hands-on lab where we're going to use the SES service to send an email. AWS Step Functions makes it easy to coordinate the components of distributed applications and microservices using a visual workflow. For example, you may want a second function to always follow the first and only run if and when the first succeeds. And you may want to execute two functions in parallel, for example. You define your application visually as a series of steps. You define the process flow of those steps and then you can deploy your application automatically. Amazon Simple Workflow Service works in a similar way to step functions in coordinating multiple components of a business process. For new applications, it's recommended to use step functions, not the SWF service. Amazon Simple Notification Service, or SNS for short, is a flexible, fully managed pub-sub messaging service. What that means is that you can create a topic and users subscribe to that topic. And when you publish a message to the topic, the users that have subscribed to that topic will receive that message. It can also be used for push notifications for mobile devices. Amazon Simple Queue Service, or SQS for short, is a fully managed message queuing service. And that makes it easy to decouple your applications from demand. What that means is that it allows messages to build up in a queue until the processing server that processes those messages can catch up with the demand. So let's have a look at an example of using these services to decouple our application from its demand. So let's just say we have an application and it's running on an auto scaling group of EC2 instances. And that application is a process server. It's not a web server. It's processing messages as they come in. And those messages could have information on an image that needs to be processed or a video that needs to be processed or a cryptography 
problem that needs to be solved. And so those messages come in, and as that demand increases, or the number of messages coming in increases, then the auto scaling group will also add more instances to cope with that increasing demand. So what happens if that increase in demand occurs over a one second period? And that is a very large spike. Our auto scaling group cannot handle that sort of scenario because it's going to take at least five or 10 minutes for instances to launch and be up and running. So what happens in the meantime is a problem for us. In the similar way that a bank has a queue. And so when people come into a bank and the teller is too busy to serve them, they can build up in a queue until such point in time that the teller can reach them. We can do the same thing with the SQS or simple queue service. We can let those messages come in and they can build up in a queue until such time that our auto scaling group of EC2 instances can get to that queue and empty out the queue. And that is great because we have now decoupled our demand from our application. And so if spikes come in, our application can handle it. But what happens when the average demand exceeds what our capacity is? So I'll give you an example. So we've got our bank and all of a sudden we had five tellers and four of those tellers have become sick. They've got influenza or whatever. But the same amount of people are coming through the door and the queue is going to build up and build up and the queue will never decrease. It will continue to increase in size indefinitely. The same thing can happen in this architecture. For example, we might have a whole heap of unhealthy instances and all of a sudden our capacity cannot meet demand. And so that SQS queue is going to grow indefinitely. Or we may have done an update to our application that is faulty and that SQS queue continues to increase. So what we can do is that we can set up a CloudWatch metric and that will alert us with an SNS email notification that our SQS queue is continue, continuing to grow and that we need to investigate that further. Now, normally we would use a metric on the instances to signal that those instances are overloaded and we need to increase our capacity of our auto scaling group. Now, in this situation, that's probably not going to happen because these messages are just going to build up in the queue. And so we need a way of notifying the auto scaling service that the queue is increasing. And the way we can do that is with, a, again, a CloudWatch metric that will alert the auto scaling group that the SQS queue is too big and to put on more instances to reduce the size of the queue. And at the same time, when the queue is empty, CloudWatch can send a metric to the auto scaling group to reduce the number of instances and terminate those so that we're not wasting those resources. Let's have a look at some customer engagement services. Amazon Connect is a self-service contact center in the AWS cloud, and that is delivered on a pay-as-you-go pricing model. It has a drag and drop graphical user interface, and that allows you to create process flows that define customer interactions without having any coding at all. Amazon Pinpoint allows you to send email, SMS, and mobile push messages for targeted marketing campaigns, as well as direct messages to your individual customers, for example, an order confirmation. Amazon Simple Email Service, or SES for short, is a cloud-based bulk email sending service. And coming up next, we're going to be doing a lab using the Simple Email Service to send an email. So make sure that you download the introduction to AWS Lab Notes, and let's get into it. In the AWS Management Console, we go to Services. And over on the right-hand side here, we've got Messaging Services. We click on SES. And the first thing we need to do is that we need to verify our email address. So we just go to Email Addresses, and we'll put in a, or we click on here to verify a new email address. 
and then we click on verify this email address. So what's happened now is that AWS has sent an email to us to verify our email. Once we click on that link, uh, we'll be able to continue to use the SES service. Okay, so when you've clicked on the verification link to the email, you'll get a uh, congratulations message that you've verified your email. So just click out of that and go back into the SES management console. If we refresh the screen, we can see that it has now been verified. So what we can do now is that we can send a test email. So just click on send a test email. We'll put in, what I'm going to do is just send a message from myself to myself so that I don't have to uh, verify any further or any additional email addresses. And just put the subject as test. Let's copy that over. And we'll send that test email. And that will be happening. And so what we can do is we'll go into our email account and we'll see that that test email will have been sent. Okay, so I've just gone and checked my email account and yes, that test email went through fine. Now, you might be questioning, what do we do now? It's one thing to send a single email, but that's not much good to us. We want to send out bulk email. Now, obviously, sending out bulk email uh, is, well, it can be, can be spam. So AWS are mindful of that, and so there is an, uh, a process that you have to go through to apply to use the SES service to, uh, to send out bulk email. So the way you do that is you go into, uh, just go into sending, sending statistics here, and you can see there is a link there to request a sending limit increase. So just reading off there, so your Amazon SES account has sandbox, sandbox access uh, in region US East Virginia. Uh, and so that is very limited to, to what you can do. Uh, and so if you're going to be using this uh, in, for example, in, in an enterprise application, then you would want to go there and uh, request a sending limit increase. And so just click on that and it'll take you to uh, a form that you fill out uh, with all your details and, uh, and you just submit that to the AWS support department and they will make that happen for you. So that's all I need to show you now on the SES uh, service and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we're going to be running through some of the analytics and machine learning services on AWS. Amazon Elastic MapReduce, or EMR for short, is AWS's Hadoop framework as a service. You can also run other frameworks in Amazon EMR that integrate with Hadoop, such as Apache Spark, HBase, Presto, and Flink. Data can be analyzed by EMR in a number of AWS data stores, including Amazon S3 and Amazon DynamoDB. Amazon Athena allows you to analyze data stored in an Amazon S3 bucket using standard SQL statements. Amazon Elasticsearch is a fully managed service for Elastic.co's Elasticsearch framework. This allows high-speed querying and analysis of data that is stored on AWS. Amazon Kinesis allows you to collect, process, and analyze real-time streaming data. Amazon QuickSight is a business intelligence reporting tool, similar to Tableau, or if you're a Java programmer, similar to BERT, and is fully managed by AWS. So let's have a look at some of the machine learning services on AWS. AWS DeepLens is a deep learning enabled video camera. It has a deep learning software development kit that allows you to create advanced vision system applications. Amazon SageMaker is AWS's flagship machine learning product. It allows you to build and train your own machine learning models and then deploy them to the AWS cloud and use them as a back end for your applications. Amazon Recognition 
provides deep learning based analysis of video and images. Amazon Lex allows you to build conversational chatbots. These can be used in many applications such as first line support for customers. Amazon Polly provides natural sounding text to speech. Amazon Comprehend can use deep learning to analyze text for insights and relationships. This can be used for customer analysis or for advanced searching of documents. Amazon Translate can use machine learning to accurately translate text to a number of different languages. Amazon Transcribe is an automatic speech recognition service that can analyze audio files that are stored in Amazon S3 and then return the transcribed text. Okay, so let's have a look at using one of these machine learning services, Amazon Recognition, for analyzing some image and video. Machine learning on AWS is one of the coolest things you can do on AWS. And Amazon Recognition is a service that just absolutely blows my mind away. The reason I say that is that 30 years ago, I used to be a young engineer and I was working in the industrial robotics industry. And back then we had a vision system that could recognize from a black and white image the difference, the difference between a triangle and a square. And back then, that was really groundbreaking stuff. And I look now over the last 30 years and where we are now compared to where we were back then, which is just unbelievable. And the potential for this stuff is absolutely beyond belief. Okay, let's get into it. It's services and then to Amazon recognition or it's R for just plain old recognition without the Amazon. So we scroll down to recognition. That'll take us into the recognition management console. And we'll try a demo. So this will take us into a lot of different demonstrations of the, of the power of this Amazon recognition. So here we can see we've got a sample image of a guy on a skateboard doing a flip. And Amazon recognition has analyzed this object in this scene in this, in this picture. And it's identified that there's a 99.2% probability that there's a skateboard there. And there's the person's a human being, he's playing a sport. Um, we can see a lot more here. He's in a parking lot. Maybe not. He's on a road, but close enough. There's cars there. He's on a road. There's buildings. So you can see there's a lot of stuff that has been picked up in that image. So how does it get there? So if we want to use this ourselves, we need to send a request to the Amazon Recognition API. Or we can do that through the one of the many software development kits that are offered by AWS. So if we had, for example, the JavaScript SDK, we would have a function there that we could send this request off to. So what does the request look like? So we can see here, we're going to uh, have our object that's in a bucket. We're going to provide the bucket name. And we're also going to provide uh, the name of the object that is our image. When we send that off to AWS recognition, it comes back with a response. And here it is. It'll come back with all of the labels that it's picked up. It's picked up a skateboard with 99.2% confidence. And there you can see there's a whole heap of stuff that, is a pick, that it has picked up from that object and scene detection. Okay, so let's see how it works with an image we give it. So we'll click on upload and we'll upload our own image. I'm just going to get a picture of an elephant and upload that. And so you can see quite quickly, it's analyzed that image. It's found an animal, an elephant, some wildlife, and that's pretty cool. So let's have a look at the other one. So we've got image moderation. So what this does is it automatically detects explicit content. So for something for a, uh, a children's site, you might want to moderate the images that are being uploaded to that, to that site. And so this is a great way to do it. So we can see here, we've got a family, a family image. So we just click on view content. And we can see that it, it's come back with nothing, absolutely nothing. So we look at the, the response. 
and it comes back with moderation, labels, nothing. The reason it came back with nothing is that it's found nothing that is explicit or suggestive adult content. So let's have a look at the other one of the girl in the bikini. And so there we can see that we have a female swimwear or underwear, 98.7% probability that that is there. And so that's a great tool that, you know, if you really want to, uh, you know, look after children, if you've got a kid's website, this is a, a great way to do it. So let's have a look at facial analysis. This is quite a good one. So we can see there that we've got a girl, she's got her sunglasses on, but it still recognizes that it's a girl. Uh, it still recognizes that she's smiling, she's wearing sunglasses, and there's a whole heap of information. Her eyes are open even. It can tell with sunglasses on, I don't know how it does that. Uh, mouth is open. Uh, and there's a whole heap of stuff there that, that it analyzed. And we can see here, it can do the same for multiple faces. And it can see that there's a male there. And so we can select each different one. So we can select this one and it says it appears to, appears to be female, 100%. 11 to 18 years old. Uh, this one here, 23 to 38 years old. So it's, it's quite amazing that it can tell the difference in ages of people from an image. And it can also identify people. So here is where it's identifying from its, uh, its database of celebrities. We've got Jeff Bezos from Amazon. And... We've got Andy Jassy from AWS. And so it's got 100% match confidence there. So we're going to do this ourselves. I'm just going to upload a, a, an image of a couple of celebrities and see whether it can do it for us as well. Okay, so it's, it's had a look at that image and it's identified that Keith Urban and Nicole Kidman are in that image with 100% confidence. I reckon that's pretty amazing, actually. But hey, that's the whole thing about facial recognition is that we're in a whole different world now that computers can recognize who we are. So let's have a look at face comparison. So here we have an image on the left of a girl and an image of the same girl with a group of other girls. And here we can see that it's identified a 98% probability that they are the same girl and it's not the other two girls. We can do the same with a different image. And so here we can see that it's identified that it is a girl on the right. Let's have a look at another one. And it has found that girl as well in the other image. And it's, and it's uh, identified that she's not the other two girls. So again, the facial recognition is really quite powerful. Let's have a look at text in image. So here we can see it's picked up text from an image. And it's picked up the number plate on a car. So obviously, there's a lot of stuff that can happen here. You know, it's obviously if you're going to be having a toll on a on a bridge or something like that, great service for doing that. Let's have a look at video analysis. Okay, so here's a, a video. Um, I'll just play it. We can see there's just a, uh, a video from AWS Live. And it has picked up that there are two people here and two of them are celebrities. They're both celebrities. So let's have a look at that. So we've got those two celebrities and it's identified. There we go. Mr. Vogels and Mr. Bezos. And it's also identified some objects in there. So it's picked up the furniture and the chair and uh, that someone's wearing it and someone's got a beard. Uh, and it's picked up quite a bit. So that brings us to the end of this little run through of Amazon recognition and by all means open it up and have a play around with it yourself and try and think about what you can do with it because remember this is uh, if you're a developer uh, you can use this as a back end by just using the JavaScript SDK which interfaces nicely with this uh, and you can you know that you can come up with some really interesting ideas for applications. I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we'll have a look at the security, identity, and compliance services of AWS. Now, this is a very important category of AWS, and as such, there is a very broad selection of products that are available.
Once we've done that, we'll finish up with a hands-on lab using the Identity and Access Management service. AWS Artifact is an online portal that provides access to AWS security and compliance documentation. And that documentation can be readily available when needed for auditing and compliance purposes. AWS Certificate Manager issues SSL certificates for HTTPS communication with your website. It integrates with AWS services such as Route 53 and CloudFront. And the certificates that are provisioned through AWS Certificate Manager are completely free. Amazon Cloud Directory is a cloud-based directory service that can have hierarchies of data in multiple dimensions. Unlike conventional LDAP-based directory services that can only have a single hierarchy. AWS Directory Service is a fully managed Microsoft Active Directory service in the AWS cloud. AWS Cloud HSM is a dedicated hardware security module in the AWS cloud. This allows you to achieve corporate and regulatory compliance while at the same time greatly reducing your costs over using your own HSM in your own infrastructure. Amazon Cognito provides sign-in and sign-up capability for your web and mobile applications. You can also integrate that sign-up process with external OAuth providers such as Google and Facebook, and also SAML2 providers as well. AWS Identity and Access Management, or IAM for short, allows you to manage user access to your AWS services and resources in your account. Users and groups of users have individual permissions that allow or deny access to your resources. AWS Organizations provides policy-based management for multiple AWS accounts. This is great for large organizations that have multiple accounts and they want to manage those and the users that use those accounts centrally. Amazon Inspector is an automated security assessment service. It can help to identify vulnerabilities or areas of improvement within your AWS account. AWS Key Management Service, or KMS for short, makes it easy to create and control encryption keys for your encrypted data, and it also uses hardware security modules to secure your keys. It's integrated well with AWS services such as Amazon S3, Redshift, and EBS. AWS Shield provides protection against distributed denial of service, or DDoS for short, protection against DDoS attacks. The standard version of AWS Shield is implemented automatically on all AWS accounts. Web Application Firewall, or WAF for short, is a web application firewall that sits in front of your website to provide additional protection against common attacks such as SQL injection and cross-site scripting. It has different sets of rules that can be used for different applications. Now let's have a look at using one of the core AWS security services, Identity and Access Management, or IAM. Now up until now, we've been logging into our account using the email address and password that we use to create that account. And that is logging in as a root user, and it is not desirable to do that. The reason I say that is that the root user will have access to everything, access to finances, credit card, access to locking people out of that account. And so that is something that cannot be compromised. Otherwise, you're in a, a lot of trouble. So what we do is that we lock that down. We, we put a very long password and complicated password on that account. And we can also have multi-factor authentication if we want to go to that next step of, of locking that down. Once we've locked down our root access, we can create an IAM user. And we can log in as that IAM user, and that IAM user will have permissions specific for what we need to do. And so if we, for whatever reason, need root access, we can still get that if we need to. 
but we log in for the most part as an IAM user and that protects our account. So again, we go to services and we look for the IAM service. Now, once we're in there, we can go to users on the left here and we can create a user by clicking on add user. We'll give that user a name. I'm just gonna call it test, that'll be fine. Now that user can have management console access. Yes, we would like that, but they can also have programmatic access. If they're going to be connecting in through a software development kit or connecting in through the command line interface remotely. So we're going to give both of those for, and it's because it's going to be ourselves that'll be assuming this user. We can put in a custom password there. So I've just put in a password that I'll remember. And we won't worry about changing that password because it's for us, not for someone else. So what, once we've done that, then we can attach permissions to that user. So we click on next permissions. Up the top here, we've got attach existing policies directly. So AWS have already done the work of writing policies specifically for job functions. So if we click on that, and what we can do is we can select the administrator access, and that provides full access to AWS services and resources, but that does not include financial and that sort of secure account management stuff. So we can attach that policy to this user that we've created. So we click on review and we can see there, we've got a username test and they've got both programmatic access and management console access. And their permissions are defined in that administrator access. So basically gives you full access to use all of the resources or all of the services. We click on create user. So that user has now been created. And we can see here we've got an access key and a secret access key. And we can download all of this information. So if we download that now, and we can save that somewhere, and that's our credentials. So when we open it up, that file, it will have information about how we log into the management console. So before we would have been logging in from aws.amazon.com, but now we've got our own sign in link and yours will be different. And if we click on that now, we will be able to sign in as that IAM user. So you will have your account ID or if you've created an alias, it will be an alias. Now I've created an alias from my account called Backspace-Labs, but you will no doubt just have your account ID there put in the name of that user that we created. And then we put in the password that we created for that user as well. And if we sign in now, we should be able to get in. And so there you go. We're, we've signed in back to where we were in the AWS Management Console. So now we don't need to use those root user credentials. So what we can do now is we can change those root user credentials. So to do that, we need to log in as the root user. So we go to our account up here. So I'm logged in as test. So I want to sign out and then log in with root access. So I click on sign out and that'll take me back to the AWS homepage. So if I go back into my account, AWS Management Console, and I get this screen that we had before. Down the bottom here is a link, sign in using root account credentials. So I'm gonna click on that. And that's going to get me into my root user. So I just sign in. And there we go, we're signed in now as the root user of the account. So what we can do now is do the same thing again. We go into our account details here, but we go down to my security credentials. And what we can do now is it's going to give us a warning that we're going to be changing the security credentials of the entire account. So that is what we want to do. So we're going to continue to security credentials. And here we can see up the top here is password. And you click here to change the password name or email address of your root access account. So we click on that. 
and here we can go. So we can update the password. So we click on edit and we can put our current password in and then our new password, which I'm not going to change because I, I don't want to change it. But I'd advise you to do that and put in a really, really long and complicated password. Use a password generator to do that. Uh, and that will help to secure down your AWS account. You can also enable multi-factor authentication. It's a little bit of a long-winded process, but that will give you a little bit more security as well if you want to go down that process. So for now, um, I don't want to stay in the root user, so I'm going to log out. And next time I log in, I'll use my IAM user. So that's all I need to show you now on creating a IAM user. Going through the course, we're going to learn a lot more about IAM. And if you're going on to do an associate level certification, you'll, you'll be a, an absolute whiz of this by the end of it. You'll be writing policies. You'll be doing a lot more with this. So I'll look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we're going to finish up with our overview of AWS by looking at the developer, media, mobile, migration, business productivity, and finally, Internet of Things services. We'll then finish up with a look at one of those services, Amazon Workspaces. AWS Cloud9 is an integrated development environment running in the AWS Cloud. It allows you to deploy servers directly to AWS from an integrated development environment. We will be using Cloud9 extensively if you go on to the Developer Associate Pathway with Backspace Academy. AWS CodeStar makes it easy to develop and deploy applications to AWS. It can manage the entire CICD pipeline for you. It has a project management dashboard, including an integrated issue tracking capability powered by Atlassian Jira software. AWS X-Ray makes it easy to analyze and debug applications. This provides you with a better insight to the performance of your application and the underlying services that it relies upon. AWS Code Commit is a Git repository, just like GitHub, and it's running in the AWS cloud. AWS Code Pipeline is a continuous integration and continuous delivery service, or CICD for short. It can build, test, and then deploy your code every time a code change occurs. AWS Code Build compiles your source code, runs tests, and then produces software packages that are ready to deploy on AWS. AWS Code Deploy is a service that automates software deployments to a variety of compute services, including Amazon EC2, AWS Lambda, and even instances that are running on-premises. We will be using Code Pipeline, Code Build, and Code Deploy quite a bit if you're going on to do the Developer Associate Pathway with Backspace Academy. We'll be creating a fully integrated CI-CD pipeline that will automatically package Node NPM packages and run tests using Mocha before deploying to an AWS environment. AWS recently acquired a media production services company called Elemental, and as a result, there are some very high quality broadcast media services available on AWS. AWS Elemental Media Convert is a file-based video transcoding service for converting video formats for video on-demand content. Media Package prepares video content for delivery over the internet. It can also protect against piracy through the use of digital rights management. Media Tailor inserts individually targeted advertising into video streams. Viewers receive streaming video with ads that are personalized for them. AWS Elemental Media Live is a broadcast grade live video processing service for creating video streams for delivery to televisions and internet connected devices. Elemental Media Store is a storage service in the AWS cloud that is optimized for media. 
And finally, Amazon Kinesis Video Streams streams video from connected devices through to the AWS cloud for analytics, machine learning, and other processing applications. So let's have a look at the mobile services that are available on AWS. AWS Mobile Hub allows you to easily configure your AWS services for mobile applications in one place. It generates a cloud configuration file which stores information about those configured services. AWS Device Farm is an app testing service for Android, iOS and web applications. It allows you to test your app against a large collection of physical devices in the AWS cloud. And finally, AWS AppSync is a GraphQL backend for mobile and web applications. If you're a developer and you don't know what GraphQL is, then make sure you go out and find out because it is absolutely revolutionizing the way we think about data. So let's have a look at the migration services that are available on AWS. AWS Application Discovery Service gathers information about an enterprise's on-premises data centers to help plan migration over to AWS. Data that is collected is retained in an encrypted format in an AWS Application Discovery Service data store. AWS Database Migration Service orchestrates the migration of databases over to the AWS cloud. You can also migrate databases with one database engine type to another totally different database engine type. For example, you can migrate from Oracle over to AWS Aurora. AWS Server Migration Service can automate the migration of thousands of on-premise workloads over to the AWS cloud. This reduces costs and minimizes the downtime for migrations. AWS Snowball is a portable petabyte scale data storage device that can be used to migrate data from on-premise environments over to the AWS cloud. You can download your data to the Snowball device and then send it to AWS, who will then upload that to a storage service for you. So let's have a look at the business productivity and desktop streaming applications. Amazon WorkDocs is a secure, fully managed file collaboration and management service in the AWS cloud. The web client allows you to view and provide feedback for over 35 different file types, including Microsoft Office file types and PDF. Amazon WorkMail is a secure, managed business email and calendar service. Amazon Chime is an online meeting service in the AWS cloud. It is great for businesses for online meetings, video conferencing, calls, chat, and to share content both inside and outside of your organization. Amazon Workspaces is a fully managed, secure desktop as a service. It can easily provision streaming, cloud-based Microsoft Windows desktops. Amazon AppStream is a fully managed, secure application streaming service that allows you to stream desktop applications from AWS to an HTML5 compatible web browser. This is great for users who want access to their applications from anywhere. Now, one area that is really progressing rapidly is the Internet of Things on AWS. So let's have a look at some of these services. AWS IoT is a managed cloud platform that lets embedded devices such as microcontrollers and Raspberry Pi to securely interact with cloud applications and other devices. Amazon Free Atos is an operating system for microcontrollers, such as the microchip PIC32, that allows small, low-cost, low-power devices to connect to AWS Internet of Things. 
AWS Greengrass is software that lets you run local AWS Lambda functions and messaging, data caching, sync, and machine learning applications on AWS IoT connected devices. AWS Greengrass extends AWS services to devices so they can act locally on the data they generate while still using cloud-based AWS IoT capabilities. There's some really cool stuff going on on game development on AWS. So let's have a look at some of it. Amazon GameLift allows you to deploy, scale and manage your dedicated game servers in the AWS cloud. Amazon Lumberyard, you can see there we've got some images of some pretty cool stuff. It's a game development environment and cross-platform AAA game engine on the AWS cloud. So let's have a look at one of these services, AWS Workspaces. Now Workspaces, it will stream a Windows desktop to your end users. Now that is great if you've got an enterprise of you know, hundreds of employees, you can get those new employees up and running quite quickly. Now this is not a lab and I, I, I encourage you not to do this as a lab. The reason being is that to create a workspace is quite quick and easy. But to clean it up afterwards and making sure that you don't get a bill at the end of the month is not as easy. So probably best if you just sit back and watch me actually do this uh, rather than take the risk of getting a bill at the end of the month. So first off, we go to services and then we go to workspaces and that will take us in to the workspace management console. And if we've never created a workspace before, we'll get this screen here. So we can click on getting started or get started now. And we'll do the quick setup. And we're going to use a standard with Windows 10. And what we've got to do now is that we've got to put some users in. So I'm just going to put myself in or put someone in as a, as a user. Okay, so that will actually now launch or create a, a workspace for us. And this user, Joe, or Joe's, Joe Blogs, will be able to access that just the same as they would access that on a normal desktop environment. So we'll now click this launch workspaces. So we can see now it's now being launched. It's not a, an, an instantaneous action. It will take quite some time before this workspace appears. Okay, so after about half an hour, we've got this available. It, it normally takes about 10 minutes to get to the pending status, and then about another 20 minutes or so to get to the available status. So once it's available, what we can do next is that we can get our user that we've created, and we've, if we created multiple users, they would be listed here, and we can invite that user. So we just click on invite, and it will send an invitation email with a link. So we click on send invite, and that will be sent. And then once that's done, then that, uh, that account for, for this desktop environment will be uh, validated. So what we can do now is we can go to, we can expand this here and we can go to the client's link. So we go to that. And what we can do from here is that we can download the application that will install on our desktop that will connect to this desktop stream. So we can download it for Windows, Mac, tablet, whatever. Um, but once we've downloaded that, we're going to have an environment that's going to be very similar to a native environment uh, on our desktop. So once you receive that invite email, you'll get a screen like this where you can put your, your password or set your password there. Once you've done that, click on Update User. And what you can do then is install the Workspaces client, which is what I'm going to do now. And then you'll get a, a key to actually log into that. Okay, so I've installed Workspaces desktop client and I've got my email that has my, uh, my registration code and all I need to do is put that in there and register. And now I just sign in with, with my credentials.
Okay, so now we have a fully blown uh, Windows desktop environment, Windows 10 environment. So if we go to here and we go to view and we go show full screen, we're going to have something that is identical to a native desktop environment. So I'll just do that now. And there we go. We've got a full blown Windows desktop. There is nothing to distinguish that from anything else. So we've got all our applications that will be part of that workspace down here. And if we want to get out of that, we just go put the mouse to the top of the screen here and a little drop down will come. We just go back to view and exit full screen. So now we need to first off, we need to remove this workspace. So we select the workspace and we select remove workspaces and remove workspace. So that will take quite a while for that to happen. Probably, uh, you know, around about 10, 15 minutes. But even when that workspace has been deleted, the workspaces application has actually created a simple AD directory for us. Uh, and when we delete that workspace, we're still going to be billed for that. So we can see here, note, simple AD and AD connector are made available for you free of cost with workspaces, workmail or work docs. If there are no workspaces being used for 30 consecutive days, you may be charged for this directory as per, you know, the pricing terms and conditions, blah, blah, blah. So we don't want that to happen. So I'm going to go into it now and delete that all as well. So the first thing I'll do is go into directories. I'll select that. And I'll do actions and deregister. Okay, so that is, it's staying registered now, but it'll take some time again. Nothing happens quick with workspaces. Okay, so now after eh, five, 10 minutes, it's now no longer registered. Okay, we can see there, no longer registered, but it's still there. We're still going to get billed for it. So if we go to the directory service, so we go to services, and then directory services. We will see that it is still there. So that what we need to do now is we need to delete it from here as well. So we can't just directly delete this here because it's still got, if it would have still had that association in here, we wouldn't have been able to delete it, but now we can delete it. So we click on delete and we just need to put the name of it there. So I'm just going to copy that over. Okay, so that status is now deleting. So that has cleaned that all up for us. And that brings us to the end of this hands-on session. Again, it's not a lab. I don't recommend that you actually use this unless you are thinking about using this with your corporation or something like that. So I'll see you in the next one. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. Throughout this course, we're going to be using a lot of different AWS services. And normally that would incur a cost. So I'm going to talk about the AWS free tier. And what that does, it allows us for a period of 12 months after we first sign up for an AWS account, it allows us to use a lot of these services that we're going to be using throughout the course uh, to use those for free within certain limits. Now the AWS free tier, it's designed to enable you to get hands-on experience in using the cloud and it enables you to do that for free for a period of 12 months. Now with anything, there's going to be terms and conditions, there's going to be limits within which you have to operate. So it's going to be valid for 12 months after you sign up for AWS. So that means that if your account is already 12 months old, you're not gonna be able to take advantage of the 12 months free tier. And also some of the services or even less than 12 months. Some of them are only two months, for example. So if you've got an old account and you're going to use one of these services, uh, you might get a bit of a surprise at the end of the month on your bill. Usage limits apply. If you want to create the next Facebook using the free tier, that's not going to happen. So this is for small, small instances and small services for R&D purposes mainly. It's not available for all services, but you can get more information on what is available at aws.amazon.com forward slash free. Now within the compute category, 
The services that we'll be looking at mostly in this course and will be on the free tier will be EC2, Lambda and Elastic Load Balancing. So the thing to look at there with EC2 is that you're going to get 750 hours per month of Linux or Windows and that's going to be on a T2 Micro instance. So if you run a T2 Micro for a month and you're on the 12 month sign up and that's the only instance you're running then you will get that for free. One thing to consider though, obviously if you go for a bigger instance you're going to be paying for that but also if you go for a smaller instance. If you go for a Nano you're still going to have to pay for that. So this is only for one specific instance type being the T2 Micro. In the storage area again we've got some good services there that we'll be taking advantage of on the free tier. We've got Amazon S3, Elastic File Service, we've got CloudFront we'll be using in the next section and Amazon EBS which we'll be using uh, in the EC2 section and that all of those are available for free within limits and those limits there will be on the Amazon web page. I'm not going to read that out to you here. It's, uh, it's all available on the AWS web page and it is updating regularly but that expires after 12 months after sign up. Now we have a range of database services that are available on the free tier but we need to be careful when we're using these because some of them don't go for 12 months, some of them only go for two months and some of them like with EC2 they only, only work on a T2 micro instance, they don't work on a nano instance so you need to be aware of that. So with RDS again like with EC2 that's for a T2 micro instance, it's not for a smaller instance or a bigger instance. So make sure that you use a T2 micro if you want to get it on the free tier. Another thing to consider there is when you look at these expensive databases like Amazon Redshift that is only available for two months after sign up. So if your account is already two months old you've missed the boat on that one. Or if it's one month old you want to be very careful uh, when you stop and start that instance because you, this is a very expensive service Amazon Redshift. It's an enterprise scale service so you don't want to run that just for R&D purposes unless you're getting it on that free tier. In the application services they operate a little bit differently on the AWS free tier in that they don't expire at the end of that 12 month period. So when we look at these services that we're looking at here for SES, SQS and SWF that we'll be using within this course those services won't expire after the 12 month free tier. They'll still be free within those limits. So those limits you can see there for SES are 62,000 outbound messages and you can see there for SQS and, uh, and simple workflow service as well. So provided you stay within those limits you're fine and it doesn't you don't have to worry about what happens after the 12 month free tier term ex expires. And the last one we just look at there are the management tools that we'll be using is, is CloudWatch. So again that has limits to within which we have to operate and that doesn't expire after the 12 month free term. But AWS Trusted Advisor that's, that will expire the free, the free offer there of four best practice checks uh, that will expire after 12 month period is up. So if you want to use a Trusted Advisor make sure you do that within the first 12 months of signing up. Okay so what happens after 12 months? You've, you've had, had your account, you've gone through this course and you're still using it and your 12 months has expired and you really just don't want to keep paying for it, you just don't want to keep have another bill to keep track of and that sort of thing. So what you can do is if you just want to keep an account available just for R&D purposes you can create another AWS account using a different email address and then link that to your main account uh, using co consolidated billing uh, and that will set that up as a child account so you still just have one bill that you'll be paying for through your main account but this second account that you've created will enable you to continue to use uh, the AWS free tier provided you do everything within that new account. On your, on your old account, your main account, uh, that will still be expired as far as the free tier is concerned. So that's a way to kind of keep on going if you want to just keep playing around with AWS without having to absorb a big bill at the end of each month. So again if you want to find out more just go to the Amazon website uh, aws.amazon.com and go to forward slash free and you'll see what the latest news is on the free tier because it is changing regularly. I'll see you in the next lessons.